it is a very, very prominent part of any safari you would take. Um, unfortunately, if you go to Africa, any of the national reserves will not allow you to do night safaris as we are right now. It's very dangerous. I mean, we have the uh, predators very safely separated from the uh, prey items, otherwise we wouldn't have very many giraffes to take on. Um, but out there, everything is all mixed in. It's the wild. Um, so this is a very unique experience to have something like this, especially in the middle of uh, Florida. I mean, uh, you could spend thousands of dollars and go to Africa, and you're going to have a great time. Uh, but this is, this is something that we can uh, we can offer you here in, in South Africa. Now, uh, the fire pit, when you go to a safari in Africa, you would sit around the fire pit at the end of the day of, of, of watching all these different animals in the wild state, doing all the different things they do, running, sleeping, no sleeping. Very good at that, um, and they will share stories. They will they will talk about the different animals you've seen. Uh, but to the African people, uh, they're much more than that. A lot of the tribes they don't only see the giraffes, uh, giraffes. giraffes that are striped, they're very short. <laughs> Zebra, <laughs> <laughs> kind of running about in the back here, kind of a, kind of a nice shot. Um, uh, most of the tribes in Africa don't have written languages. Uh, the only way they can share their stories, share their history, share their culture. Um, uh, kind of pass down their morals, how you want the kids to, to live, how you want them to uh, to grow up. They pass it down in stories, and most of them are very uh, uh, animal prominent because they have all these gorgeous animals in their backyard. Um, we have a resident storyteller who's very good at uh, BSNU, as you may already know. Um, so we're going to have uh, Charles come out here and share a few of the uh, more traditional tales that you may hear. There you are! <laughs> Yippity hop! <laughs> Take it away! So what am I doing? Stop! <laughs> some uh, some traditional uh, stories. Dancing? Oh, oh stories! Yes, oh. and dancing if you can. I thought the dancing was happening again. But... We switched it up tonight. Switched it up. Well, alright! <laughs> Thinking of a tale I'd like to tell you, I, just because it's interesting. Usually the best kind. Well, <laughs> a very good choice. You know, I was traveling through Zaire and I came across this group of people, this tribe, and they were called the Jimbe. And they live very close to elephants and they really revere elephants, just as most people do, because elephants seem to possess very intriguing qualities, very human-like in a lot of ways, elephants. And so they observe elephants all the time, the way we would look at fish, whatever, to relax. <laughs> One time, they told me about seeing a matriarchal elephant who has reached the end of her life, and she's starting to fade away, falls to the ground, and the next in line, the oldest female daughter grieves for her mother. They watch this process. The herd eventually starts to move on. The grieving daughter is left behind for a while. And finally, hearing the call of the herd in the distance, she herself gives the dying matriarch one last pat with her trunk and moves on. And I tell you this story because that's how close bonded people can become with elephants. And we see these things in particular. And the Jimbe have this story about the origins of people and elephants because they believe that people and elephants used to live together. They lived together in a community, equals. But why is that not true today? Well, One day, there was a Jimbe woman who was making a dinner for her family. And she had to build a fire just like this fire here. But she didn't have enough wood for it. So she asked her friend, an elephant, because they all lived together in those days, if she could do her a favor and go out and get some wood. Well, sprung to her feet, she said, I'd be happy to help you. And off she went out to collect firewood. Twenty minutes of 
so later the elephant comes back a huge tree trunk in her trunk she places it down next to the woman the Jimbe woman very proud says here I've got you this wood for your fire that woman that Jimbe woman she looked at that huge tree trunk she <coughs> couldn't believe it she was insulted she she said to the elephant, how could you bring this huge trunk? I can even put that in my fire. It's useless. She insulted the elephant. Well, then, with no feelings, the elephant stood up and turned and slowly walked away. And on the way out, they say, the elephant picked up a goat skin, <coughs> threw it over its head, left the village and left the Jimbe people to him. All the elephants heard the story and followed suit, and that was the day that the elephant and human separated forever. Each of them putting a goat skin over their head for some reason, which eventually, as we know in African tales, the goat skin merged with the elephant's head and has become their big floppy ears. That's how that happened. That's how that happened. <laughs> I've been with that for a long time. That's how it happens, and that is the day, and that is the reason why elephants and people seem so similar today, but are in fact completely separated in their existence. I like that story <laughs> because it shows once again, as so many creation stories do, that women have screwed it up somehow. I'm just saying, I didn't write the story, but I do notice. Awesome. There's a slight trend. I do notice that it does share some similarities with some other olden stories. Now, I do have another one, another African tale. That is not misogynist, thank you. <laughs> but since the elephant story is quite short, I'll go ahead and tell you another one. Uh, here at Bush Gardens, we're, we're very happy that we've received and we'll soon be displaying cheetahs. And now let me tell you what. Uh, if you think about a cheetah's face, you all know that a cheetah is covered in spots, but they have very dark lines under their eyes. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but believe it or not, there was a time when cheetahs did not have these dark lines <coughs> under their eyes. This is how it came to be that, this, that they have them now. It was once an old hunter. He was a lazy, lazy, lazy hunter. He hated hunting for his own food. And one day he was sitting on top of a hill under a tree, being as lazy as he could possibly be. And he saw something rustle down below him. It was a cheetah, a mother, and two cubs. Well, he saw that cheetah mother sprint out after a gazelle. Make a kill. She drug the kill back to her cubs. They began to do feast. And that hunter thought to himself, I am going to train a cheetah all my hunting for. And that way I'll never have to hunt again on my own. So what he did was he waited. He waited till the evening when the mother left the cubs again to go down to the watering hole as the sun was setting. And when she was gone to go and get a drink, he snuck down and he picked up one of the cubs. Still too young to be a man. What up? Then, had an idea. Well, why well, have just one cheetah? I can have two. So he stole both of them, brought them back to the village. The cheetah mother got back to where she had left her cubs. She saw they were gone. She was devastated, heartbroken. She began to cry, the most harrowing cry, the most heart-wrenching cry you've ever heard cry of a mother for her lost babies, and it lasted the whole night through, and 
everyone in the village could hear it. There was an old man in that village who understood what that cry was, and he went out into the darkness, and he found the cheetah mother crying, and he was able to speak to the cheetah mother, and he asked her what had happened, and she told him. <laughs> she told him what had happened, that a lazy hunter had stolen her baby. <laughs> she finds it I quite didn't humorous. Her. She's, she's, I'm just, I'm sorry. It's just funny, anyways. It's so, got a bad guy in it. That's why. It's not a bad guy. Yeah. That's what she likes. It's not just a bad lady. No, a bad no, guy. this is a. I, there's no misogynist equivalent. Equal really opportunity there. Yeah. Bad yeah, there you go. Yeah. Just yeah. out of the story, <laughs> someone may screw the up. The lazy man hand. stole the cheetah. Well, the, the old man came out. He found out what happened, and he went back to the village, and he told the, the elders of the village what had happened, and all of them got together, and they approached the lazy hunter, and they reprimanded him right away for stealing a cheetah's cubs, but more importantly, he had dishonored himself by trying to use another animal to do the work he should be doing it rightly on his own and for breaking with tradition. He was forced out of the village. He was banished. And the old man who could understand the cries of the cheetah brought her cubs back to her and he apologized on behalf of all the people. But by the time he had brought the cubs back, the cheetah mother had cried so many tears permanently stained. And that is the story of how cheetahs have stains on their face. True story. Completely true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> now I will tell you the story of how tour guides have come to be. Oh boy, here we are. No, no, I'm done, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, so No, really, you want to? No. Okay, no, I'm done. <laughs> there's, there's stories like that, um, maybe a bit. Um, stories like that, little kids listen to, and then they hear about that, and then they think, okay, that's what I, I have to do. That's what I don't have to do. And this is this is what we did. The other stories that talk about the uh, great migrations of the people coming from one part of Africa to another, thousands of years ago. So there's, there's lots of different stories, but most of them have to do with animals like that.